ultimately what we do is we build that templatized time forecasting, uh, project planning, all right within Salesforce. If you care about time, dollars, and resources, Precursive can help you deal with that. Hey, welcome back to another episode of the Growth and Scaling Podcast. I'm so excited today because, you know, we talked to a lot of founders, but behind every founder, there's a team. And with those teams, you got to have those go-to guys. And today's guest is one of those go-to guys who's helped a lot of founders go from that early, early stage into their growth stages. So today I'm so happy to have with us Graham. Graham Gill, tell us who you are and what do you do? Todd, thanks a lot for having me on. Uh, I'm Graham Gill. I'm the Chief Customer Officer and General Manager of Percursive. Percursive is a Salesforce ISV. We build on top of Salesforce. We're Salesforce Lightning uh, native. Ultimately, if you care about time, dollars, and resources, Precursive can help you deal with that. So we sell into folks who run professional services organizations, uh, implementation groups, customer success support, managed offerings groups. Uh, and ultimately, what we do is we build that templatized um, time forecasting, uh, project planning, all right within Salesforce. So your sales leaders close, win a deal, boom, we're staffing and resourcing it right there for you within Salesforce. Awesome. Awesome. Now, there's a lot of people that stack on Salesforce, and obviously oh. there's a huge, huge community of this. Tell us what this company does differently and what, what, what kind of, how do they fit within the niche that they're trying to help people with Salesforce? Sure. Look, we're, 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 Salesforce, if you're familiar with it, has a lot of different verticals. Uh, we're in the professional service automation uh, okay. vertical, which is a very mature space. Um, there's some legacy players that are very cumbersome, long implementation cycles. Right, We're sort right. of for that. Uh, we, we focus in on two ICPs. We focus in on IT consulting and SaaS software companies. Okay. And what makes us different is we're very easy to set up. Um, again, you can toggle us on. There is some configuration, but you don't have to go through this really long, drawn out, convoluted process. Uh, we're all right within Salesforce, so you don't have to like cool. work with other tools. We just layer right on top of it. Where a lot of the other, and not just in the PSA space, um, you know, there's parts of it are done in Salesforce, parts of it are done in you know another interface. We're right. for better or worse, right there with with you in Salesforce. Awesome, awesome. So, so. Back to the big picture of the ICPs you're targeting, you mentioned you mentioned SaaS and you mentioned yes. um, other software. IT though, consultants. You, IT consultants, but then you also mentioned professional services. Like, yeah. how does that all how does that all mix together here? Th those sound like different things to me. Well, if you think, look, let's look at a, a, a SaaS software company, right? And okay. you think about a series. Let's say A to C um, organization. You have yeah. folks like myself. I am the ICP, right? So I I own right. um, implementation, project management, support, uh, customer success, uh, professional services, managed offerings. There are a lot of folks like me, right? So right. yes, it's it's it seems like a lot, but you often have in these organizations that are scaling, you have one person responsible for multiple functions, and that's yeah. the beauty of Percursive, right? You could run customer success with Precursive plus Salesforce. And right. so when you look at the, the two different ICPs, one is straight implementation, right? IT consulting, it is what it is. Right. They, they implement stuff. But right. on the SaaS side, that's where you see the folks like myself who own multiple groups that can benefit from a, a, a product like Precursives. Love it. Love it. Now, I, I, I think this is fascinating because there are a lot of people in this space that you're talking about. Um, obviously, Every company wants to be a SaaS company nowadays, and there's a lot of facilitation to help people become that. Now, now that we kind of know, though, what Precursive does, and now we know kind of who you're trying to serve, tell us about your role in that growth journey for Precursive. Sure. But almost more importantly, you know, a lot of people listening are sitting here going, yeah, I've, 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 got, a, I've got a company that's kind of in this growth journey that, that we just raised a Series A, maybe we're going to raise a Series B. You have done this with multiple companies. And so as yes. we talk about this journey with Precursive, I'd love to kind of capture from you the experience of going seed to, to a series that you're familiar with, where these companies are kind of hitting that growth scale. They're figuring out their, their ICPs. They're figuring out how to go. What's that journey like for you? What are some highlights of that of those journeys? Yeah, I, I, it's funny. I, I would... 
I was talking about this with a buddy of mine a, a couple of weekends ago, and he's like, wow, that sounds painful. Um, and I mean that in a really positive way, right? Like th there's a certain caliber of person, right? If you're, if you're not able to sort of see the, the big picture and you get caught in the minutia, yeah. it can be a really a grind. What I love about it and yeah. why I keep coming back to this is, the, is the, the, the sheer challenge, right? So if you look at something like percursive and, and me being the ICP, I care about time. I care about dollars. I care about resources. I care about yeah. utilization. So thinking about that, as I'm trying to grow the business at Percursive, we are onto something, right? We are in yeah. a very um, mature marketplace. But as as the mid market goes to enterprise and the yeah. challenges become more and more, the, 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 that middle band is huge, right? And there's right. a lot of folks involved in that. And being able to grow with some of these, whether it's with Percursive or even in previous organizations, watching right. the, that like seed idea go to SMB mid-market, that's where I really get excited. And the processes right. and the challenges are, are all the same, right? There's with anything, there's four ways to do it, right? At the end of the right. day, and there's probably five or six, but it's right. not, it, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And I think where these organizations get bogged down oftentimes is trying to over invent, like just yeah. let it grow. Cause potentially where your product, where your service, where your offering is going to go is going to be where you didn't even think it was when it was just that seed idea. And right. so being able to have a framework in place and what I often bring to organizations and, you know, look, there's a lot of conflict and strife sometimes with this sure. is like, we have to let this organically grow with right. some guardrails. If we have right. wide open guardrails, it goes out of control, but yes. if we can let it grow and gravitate. It almost does the work for you. And that that's what I love about this, right? Is, you know, surrounding myself with smart people, smart team, curious people, Maybe a little bit of people who've done it before, or maybe right. people who've never done it before, but are just right. willing to let it see where it goes. I love that response because, you know, especially in your role doing CX and, and just really listening to customers helps you guide your product development if you're listening to customers, right? If you're not listening to customers, what kind of problems do they run into? <laughs> well, you, you, you end up, look, I, I've been in organizations, <laughs> uh, not percursive, um, but yeah. I've been in organizations where you can look, um, look, I'm from the Northeast of, of the United States, and you can see um, a 1970s house that was built on different parts, different decades. I always take that. I use terrible metaphors, Todd. You'll, you'll get to learn <laughs> learn that about me. But you you look at some of these products and you can see the garage that was added on in 1975. You can see right. the old kitchen that was updated in 1982. Right. That's not a sustainable product or service. Right. The right. ones that are successful are the ones that actually revamp and grow and expand and listen to the right customers, right? right. And the right, right customers are not necessarily the same as the ones that kept the lights on early. And I think that's the hardest thing. Oh I've gosh. walked into organizations where we've had one point million dollar clients annual that were dragging the product down. And right. it was a very hard decision to say, you're now in maintenance or we don't want to renew you. One of the totally I was part of an acquisition and my mind was absolutely blown, Todd. We sent um uh what the heck do we call them? uh we were uh, basically, we weren't going to renew. So instead of yeah. a client giving us the breakup, we gave the, the client the breakup because right. that business was holding us back. And that's super hard, right? If you were in the trenches so with some hard. of these clients, I, I mean, I, I, I'd be curious if you've come across that before, but oh, yeah. it is one of the most mind numbing things no. to say like, look, we acknowledge that you got us to this point, right? but you're holding us back. Dude. One hundred percent. Not only have I seen that, but I've done that. And and I got to tell you, like one of the things that the very first thing that we do when we help a company in their growth journey is we look at their existing client database. We look at their. We we actually ask our clients say, okay, the last hundred clients that you've onboarded, or twenty, or you know, depending on the size of the scope of the company that they work with, who are your three favorite? Who are your three worst? And let's evaluate the commonalities between these companies because, you know, and even with the product, same thing. It's like, okay, of the la of the, if we took a list of every product you've sold in the last three years, how would you rate your profitability and ease of execution or fulfillment for each of those products? And you see very clearly that sometimes the passion play of the initial client that you onboarded or the initial product that you launched with 
you feel like you got to hold on to that for some reason and you just don't have to. Right. It's, 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 it's a, an amazing exercise to take a founder or founder or founding team or, or right. an executive team through. One of the things that I love to do is it's sort of like you do with your, on the front end is I love to go right. to the back end. So to support and you, you look yeah. and you start distilling through all this data and with all the tools that are out there now, it's, it's not line right. by line item like we used to do it, but you start realizing the amount of time, the amount of cycles you're burning. And then you look at the yeah. ARR and it's like, 12,000, which look is not a small amount, but if right. your top end is 1.2 and you're spending cycles on a $12,000 a year client, totally. something's wrong. And that's totally. a very hard thing to like that. that that's why I, wh- one of the things that I've been trying to use more in, in, in just in my overall engagements and in my life is right. th- not data analysis to a, to a paralysis, but just data to like, does it pass the sniff test? Does totally. it make sense that we're spending 80 hours on a $12,000 client? Like the, the clear answer is no, but right. sometimes that might be the one client that, you know, the CEO plays golf with, or, totally. you know, they were the second client and they took a chance on totally. you and they wrote that $12,000 check and they've been doing the same thing for, for 12 years. Um, it, it's, it's an amazing exercise to go through, whether it's in your organization or from a consulting perspective, like you're, you're coming in at it. Totally. Now it, it honestly is, it's a, it's the exercise of taking emotion out of the equation and just looking at it from a financial perspective. Was it worth spending 80% of our marketing budget on that product that brings us the least amount of profit? <laughs> you know? So the, the, the shiny pe- penny syndrome, I think, is something in, you know, that, that's what I call it. It's like, hey, this is the next thing we're going to build. I would love to see some statistics on the, the you know, the Fortune 500s totally. or whatever in, indices you want to use. What the what the throwaway effort in new products was oh, o- over their journey to get where they are? I mean, it must be billions and billions oh, yeah. of dollars. And you think about oh, yeah. you know a small seed company spending uh seven hundred thousand dollars, three million dollars on this. Like that's so much wasted effort. And I think it's it's right. super hard. Founders are visionaries, right? right. And I respect that. Um, I'm a failed founder mainly because I don't. <laughs> know how I would ever make pay- payroll. I, I think I we may have talked about that story. I just I panic, yeah. right? But founders are visionaries, and it's very hard to say to someone like rein that in. But when right. you see it done right, and you see a founder kind of go, "Oh my God, if I didn't listen yeah. or if I didn't step back for a second, we would never be that two hundred million dollar company or three hundred million dollar company," right? I am so glad you're here, and I just wanted to take a few seconds to tell you about a program that we have assembled with a lot of our podcast guests and a lot of people who are listening to the show who are feeling the same way that they do. There's a recurring theme. You'll hear a lot of these founders talk about, I couldn't have done it without my team. I couldn't have done it without a a support group of peers. I couldn't have done it without having someone to talk to that understood my feeling of isolation as an operator of my business. You see, you're not alone. It is hard running a business, and it's even harder when you know you can't express all your deepest concerns and frustrations with your executive team. It makes them nervous, it gets them scared. You don't want scared people on your executive team. So where do you turn? The Captain's Council is where you turn. The Captain's Council, it is an organization that we are put together with podcast guests, as well as people who are listening who are in the same boat. You see, peers are the only ones that can give you the type of empathy, the type of advice that only a founder or operator know and understand. Go check it out at captainscouncil.com. I know you're gonna love what you see there. We have put together an organizational structure that has small group settings, a global community of founders and operators, as well as monthly and quarterly in-person events. You're going to love what you see there. I can't wait for you to check it out and enjoy the rest of this episode. All right. So so on the, on the listening end of this podcast, we do have a lot of founders who are in these growth stages. Like they, they are, they're so excited because they made it through launch, right? And launch, as you know, launch is a pain in the butt. Like you are, you know, literally throwing everything out in the world that you can related to your product trying to get that thing to get off, get off the ground. And when it finally does, you're like, yeah, dude, we made it. What, now that you've done this with multiple companies, 
And you've seen some founders adapt better than others to to what the demand really is out there for their product. And and maybe you've seen even some companies that have a much clearer vision of where they want to be versus where they're they're currently playing. Mm-hmm. How have you seen that? Like, what are the best case scenarios and what are some mistakes that you've seen? So look, I, I'm I'm very transparent. I've been and and I won't name names, but I've been through absolute crash and burn situations. And I've right. been through four relatively successful um, growth exits. Um, right. I, I think that the, the commonality on both is the, is the stubbornness, the drive, the determination, the, the focus, whether good or bad, on making it work. Right. I think one of the hardest things, and there, there's a lot of books about this. Um, I, I probably should know the names of some of these, but you know, <laughs> I can speak for myself. I will never run a billion dollar company. Right. Like, I know my limitations. I know right. where my sweet spot is. I think one of the hardest things is now that you've made it, that often means either you're now ready for the next funding round or you're starting to take more money in. And it's very hard. Now there's, when you take other right. people's money, what often happens at that level, yeah. there becomes a scrutiny that maybe you were not operating under in the, in the past. Totally. And the ones that are, to answer your question directly, the ones that are successful either have brought in you know, like a co-team to, that can now help them get to the next level, or they raise their hand and said, I need some form of, of guidance. I need a peer support. I need I a it. listening group. Um, that those are the most successful, the ones that look, they're the odd occasions. And you, you read in, in, in all Very the tech papers occasions. where someone just, someone just, no matter what it works. Right. Um, but the reality is it's a, junkyard of of failures totally. out there right uh, across the board so the smart ones are the ones that find teams that that, that can surround themselves to then help them get it. to the next level i love it and you know i i've seen that in the case of myself and i see it in, in other successful founders as well where it is either a peer network and it can be something as casual as hey i'm going to lunch tomorrow with like five other guys that own businesses or it could be something formal you know and and but regardless, when you get in a room with other people carrying the same burden as you of, I got, I got a hundred families I got to feed this month. And, yeah. um, if I make a bad decision, I just, you know, they may not eat, <laughs> you know, like those are the types of things that founders think about that most, most employees don't really ever wonder in their head. Oh, are we going to hit payroll this month? Oh. Yeah, I mean that that's that's an incredibly crushing weight to you know go to yeah. bed uh, every night. Again, that's part of the reason why I'm I'm a failed founder. I literally pulled the plug <laughs> when things started to get successful. But I think here's I, I would add one caveat to that, Todd. Yeah, you need to make, sh- in my humble opinion, yeah, you need to make sure that you're not either talking into the echo chamber or right. surrounding yourselves with. 10 Todds. I like you. Right. You add value. Do I want a team right. of 10 of you? No, I want dissenting voices. I want different um, opinions. I want to get to that. Like I've often said, I, I don't have a better analogy, the dark side of the moon, right? Someone that sat at every angle of that table right. and being like, look, Graham, you're going down a very difficult path. Yeah. I've been there and here's <laughs> why. And it's like, Ooh, I never thought about it from that angle. Right. Those are the smart founders that that are open and that's very hard because that, that's vulnerability. Um, you know, obviously you, you, you might perceive someone as being successful. So therefore yeah. I want to be around them. I want to hear their ideas, but yeah. you know, building a, an iPhone versus building some other SaaS software is, is totally. drastically different, right? It, it doesn't translate one-to-one. Some of the experiences do, right. but like you couldn't just take the, I don't know, fix it on Apple, the, the Apple blueprint and say, Hey, that's going to work you know, taught at your company or a precursor or any of these other ones. Now, my question for you is after having seen this a few times, and obviously like me, you get older through the years and you learn a little more, yeah, a few more things (laughs) on say your last venture you've been helping on versus your first venture you helped on. I see so often during launch phase, a founder's hiring their buddies, they're hiring their friends, they're hiring people that'll support them. They hire a lot of yes men. They hire people that can wear lots of hats. The reality is, is that if they don't hunker down and get those people in their circle that are very specialized in the areas where they need them, 
What, tell us what you've seen happen. What, that, that, that's a huge transition it, point for a company. It, it, exactly right. I think that's like when you start to make it. Like I, I, I still think there is a, and I, I often with, with my, my, my friend Ronnie, her and I often talk about the, the jack of all trades, which used to be like this negative thing, still right. has value. I think right. in startups, it certainly does. Um, you can continue that once you make it. But in my opinion, that the only type of person that's successful in that is if you are if you have KPIs for each hat you wear, right? right? So if right, you look right, at, right, I'll right, use myself right. as an example, I have many areas, right? Outside of my, yeah. my, my CCO role, right? I have training and name, all that, but... I have KPIs for each one of those. Yeah. And so, so you, you have to be able to be measured with all those different hats and you have to be yeah. very clear if you're going to have that. But I do think that when you get to a certain level, you have to have your, your CS motion. You have to have your, right. your, your basically your revenue triangle, CS, marketing, sales. sales. That needs to be anchored and that needs to be humming together. And if there's anyone that's not focused on the growth and trajectory of a company to that next right. level, you're never going right. to get there. Now, I, I've worn the CS role for a long time. We, one of my companies was a, a customer service uh, company for several years. And we would, we would get very involved with the companies we were working with on helping that CS department or the customer experience role really turn into a revenue center. And mm -hmm. a lot of our founders listening are trying to think, the only thing they think about when they think of revenue is new client acquisition. Will you just shed some light from your perspective on how absolutely naive that is to think that your biggest revenue center shouldn't be your existing client base? I, I think it's one of the things that's so misunderstood, and I, I think right. there's a lot of different um, a, a lot of different avenues and approaches to customer success. I mean, at the end of the day, that's like there's four, right? And yeah. it can either be revenue generating, it could be reactive, proactive. You can run safe plays, journey mapping. I think the one thing that founders often overlook, or, or they try to jump to do too quickly, is like we've sold you one thing. It's yeah on or it's implemented, I'm ready to sell you more stuff. And the reality right. is you have to build relationships. So I often approach, um, I, again, I don't like sales, but I participate <laughs> in a lot of it because understanding where a, right. a client or prospect, prospect is going to be in six, nine, 12, 18 months helps you get that natural expansion. It should be organic. Um, CS oftentimes, and I'm very proud of the teams that I've led over the years, yeah. in multiple occasions, quarter after quarter, we've actually outsold sales simply by having our finger on the pulse, having the relationship, understanding, listening for expansion opportunities. So I, totally. I write and talk a lot about totally. if you're going to do CS, you need to be connected to revenue, especially in 2023. Was where we are, right? Like if you're That's not, That's if you're, year. if you're a loss leader or if you're, um, or if you're a cost center with a lot of overhead, it's not going to work. But if you're attached to revenue and driving true revenue expansion, that's where you want to be. That's the model that I believe founders should be looking towards. Not just 100%. like we've sold you and we're ready to sell you again. You have 100%. to build those relationships. There's no shortcutting that in my opinion. In fact, I, you know, from a personal experience, you know, my the last fall, I took, I had an experience, a negative experience with a client and, uh, and I went back to the drawing board and I said, you know, how do I, I did the same exercise I have my clients do, which is of the last, you know, few dozen clients I've onboarded, which ones do I love? Which ones do I not love? And, and I did, I kind of went through this exercise. I didn't whiteboard it. It was just kind of a own personal couple of hour exercise. And what I recognized was, you know, I absolutely love these, these 10 companies, love them. These other guys, they just, all they do is they're throwing on my side. And I made the decision to, to price these other guys out and double down on the ones that I loved. And not only did my revenue increase, it, it was a net positive thing because the companies I doubled down on, we found more ways to work together more ways to enhance their company with our services. And we literally dropped the other clients that I didn't like so much off the tail end and just focused all my energy on these guys. And now they're referring people. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like now they've become a new sales engine for me. 
you, you create a culture of winning, right? And I, I listen to, a, I'm a college hockey fan in uh, Quinnipiac University. Uh, my alma mater just won the uh, national championship for college hockey. Congrats. I listened to their coach, Ren Pecknell, talk, and he was talking about like what made someone successful. Trust me, this ties in, Todd. Um, <laughs> what makes them successful at Quinnipiac? And they went back and they looked at 13 years of player data of folks coming into, into the organization. Some were super gifted. Some were, you know, this and that. And they looked and they broke it down to um, right. hockey IQ and culture. And so Love if you it. think about the type of clients when you're going out like percursive, we have two ICPs, but within that, I could tell you, because I have a marketing background and I work right. with our marketing group, that there's a subset of that that we just don't want to touch for the exact totally. reason that you said, because totally. you know that it's going to be a time suck. You know there's going to be some sort of yeah. – sky is falling constantly so right. it's that refinement and understanding the sweet spot and the willingness to to surround yourself with people that you trust to say yeah our, our icp is here but we really need to focus on on this because that's the one that we can get through we can expand the ref they will reference us they'll bring us in they'll introduce us to folks they'll bring us to conferences they'll ask us to speak yeah. all that other stuff that's not just a sale that's super yeah. important to generating business Amen. <laughs> I love it. No, this, this is a great, this is a fantastic conversation. Honestly, uh, for those of you listening, th these are the steps that you need to be considering as you're going into growth journey. Like launching is so fun. It's so exciting. There's a thousand other podcasts to listen to for, for launch. These things that Graham and I are talking about today are essential pieces of your next stage growth journey. Even if you're a large company, these are essential steps for getting to that next stage of growth. And, and I want to just, you know, kind of finish this conversation off by, by asking you, Graham, you know, as you have been involved in all these startups and, and Precursive's greatly blessed by having you, you, you now know the hats, you wear the best, you're, you're probably a great asset to them. But as you, as you look out across the spectrum of companies you've worked with and people in your life who have been a big impact on you, can you give a shout out to people that you feel like have, have kind of helped you get to where you're at right now? I mean, look, th there, this goes back. My, my father was in business and I, I learned a tremendous amount from him and some of the old school folks. Right. Um, I, have a con I have a really tight knit group now cool. um, of, of about seven or eight folks. You know, I text. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll name them because I, I think it's important. You know, these are awesome. all folks in the last two weeks I've talked to. So I, I mentioned Ronnie Gone, her and I, uh, she's a, a CSM at Zoom. Her and Love I it. talk quite a bit. Jeff Heckler, who I know you've spoken to. Yeah. Michael yeah. Anaya, um, my buddy Josh Shatter from Update AI. He and I are constantly, he's a founder. He struggles. I struggle. We bounce ideas. Right. Uh, Peter Armley, he's a great CS lead uh, or just a, a visionary in the CS, CS space for many years. Love so it. a lot of these like more complex as I'm growing, I can bounce off of him. Uh, Dickie Sai, he's, a, um, he, he's building a, a product called Cast app and Love he's it. you know he's a founder he's done it before he's going through uh alex farmer uh who's a, a a really strong in the cs space he's also growing small companies like myself so i try to Love surround it. myself with with peers um not just peers but also like outstretches right and and this yeah. goes back i've always i've always um you know reached out to people i've never been afraid i mean that's how you and i kind of got together totally um you you have to surround yourself with different voices um, so that you can get that creative juice going. So yeah, networking and, and just having a, a tight sense of, of, of community and, and folks you can bounce ideas off of is, is super important. A any founder listening, a any business leader listening, you have to have that network. You have to have those peers who you can go and talk to. If you don't, it is so lonely, so lonely. A and you just end up making stupid decisions. But when you can put yourself in a situation to learn and grow from other people dealing with similar situations, it just gets you there faster. Yeah. And, and I think, look, I'm sure you see it with your business. The, the, the seat at top um, has a lot of pressure and a lot of um, oh, responsibility, or whether it's feeding the hundred families as, as you, the metaphor you used, or, yeah. um, you know, trying to figure out how to attract the, the right investors. I it's, it's, I've never seen, at least in the organizations I've been a part of or, or known, I've never yeah. seen someone just be able to figure out all on their own. They, they think they do, and they have a blueprint, right. 
Right. But it's that network and it's that dissenting voice that like checks and balances, right? Um, totally. that, that that really makes them successful. Ah, love it. I love it. I love all the shout outs you gave today. Kudos to all of you for being that impact on Graham. And Graham, thank you so much for being here. Honestly, I, I appreciate the time you've taken out of your day to do this. And I hope it helps people. Where can people get a hold of you if they want to follow you on social, you active places? Where are you at? Uh, just, just really just LinkedIn. Um, you could go to my Twitter and see me yell at the, the cable company, but uh, you can find me on uh, on LinkedIn. And I, I love cool. to hear from folks, whether it's a founder or whether someone that's, you know, trying to get into, you know, the startup scene or you cool. know, has failed and is trying to re reset their lives. That That's where you can find me. Love it. Love it. Well, thank you so much. And for all of you listening, we look forward to catching you on the next episode. Hey, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. It was very fun. It just kept going and going. And I think the content was super relevant. That's why I didn't want to cut it off. The relevancy to you should be obvious. You have to be thinking about these teams and the specialists and the people that you need to help you facilitate good, solid growth within your business. Every founder is going to deal with this at some point. Either you're going to lose your business or you're going to grow your business. As you're in this growth journey, make sure you have the right people around you. Make sure you have the right unifying collective goals and strategies. We oftentimes call this a mission or a vision and make sure that everyone's going to the same place you are. Great conversation. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you're enjoying the content of this podcast because I'm telling you right now, I am doing this for you because I know how hard it is to be a founder. I know how hard it is to grow and scale a business. And I want you to know that other people are dealing with the same set of challenges you are. So listen to more episodes, get, get to know these founders, follow up with them, connect with them. I promise that if you do, you're going to find resources to help you with the answers you need for your growth journey. And I cannot wait to see you and meet you in our community. Love having you as part of the podcast. And we'll see you on the next episode. Like, share, subscribe. We'll see you later.